Evet. Birinci Uluslararası Ortak Tarih ve Kültür Sempozyumu. The First Yemen. International uh, Common History and Culture Symposium. Yemen, a Political Dynamics and Humanitarian Aid is the name of our symposium and we're starting the uh, first afternoon session. Um, the session is being held online and we're going to learn a lot of information. In this session, we will talk about the historical dynamics in the last period of the Ottoman Empire. And the first speaker is Professor Talal Hamoud Abdul El Mikafi from Yemen Taiz University. And his speech is going to be about the observation of a, a Yemeni's uh, ambassador in Istanbul at the end of Abdul Hamid II's um, uh, period. Uh, and this would be again under the um, light of uh, Mohammed Gamdan's uh, journey. Professor Mikafi, can you can you hear us? Mr. Talal, can you hear us? Can you hear the speaker? No. We don't have his voice. Hem yurt dışından hem de dijital ortamdan bağlantı olduğu için Mr. Al Mikafi, can you hear us? Hello. Uh, Professor Talal Hamoud Abdu Al Mikafi, can you hear us, sir? <coughs> Sunumunu Arapça yapacak sanırım. Hocam söz hakkı istemiş ama e, konuşabilir aslında. Yani, e, yöneticinin söz hakkı mı vermesi gerekiyor? Yönetici. Evet, ses açık hocam konuşabilir. Herkesin ki açık normalde. Ha, talal hanım. Merhaba, Esselamu Aleyküm, Talal Ahmet. Hello, Esselamu Aleyküm, Talal Hamad. Sesi alabiliyor musunuz? Can you hear his voice? Ben ekranda gözükmeye başladı, siz görebiliyor musunuz? He started showing up on the screen, but we don't have his Ses. voice. We can't, we can't hear you. Evet. Bey, siz ona söyleyebilir misiniz sesin gelmediğini? Mümkün. Evet ses gelmeye başladı. Biraz daha yüksek sesle ifade ederse daha net gelir. Evet. 
Evet, Talal Bey söz sizde. Ben şu an e, Halal Bey'in sesini alamıyorum. Siz duyabiliyor musunuz? Hocam dilerseniz diğer katılımcılarımıza geçelim. Talal Hoca da bu konuda e, teknik anlamda sıkıntısını giderir. Peki. O zaman sıraya göre e, Talal Bey'i bir sonraki sıraya bırakalım. Sıra ikinci so, sıradan. E, let's move on with the other speakers. Uh, we will have uh, associated professor... Um, ...from Kastamonu University... Um, And he's going to uh, talk about. He's going to talk about the British mandate in the First World War, and the attitude of the tribes. Let me start with the importance of my work. You know, the war had started in Europe and Yemen in historical dynamics and in uh, geographic uh, features, it has no connection with the war, but as the Ottoman Empire entered the war, the Ottoman Empire declared an Islamic Jihad and Yemen became a part of that. At the focus of our work, is when there was a war declared, the tribes in Yemen, especially the Muslim tribes, how did they uh, perceive the war? There were tribes that stood by the Ottoman Empire and In March 1914, some other tribes were, uh, uh, they, they had fallen under the British mandate um, and they were uh, following a pro-British uh, attitude. So they were Muslim tribes as well. So both sides were Muslim tribes. Uh, the, the, pro-Ottoman and pro-British side. So I'd like to follow uh, this uh, division. I'd like to talk about the resources of my presentation. As you know, you know, people about 100, 100 years back, it's not possible for us to measure Uh, their um, spiritual status from today. But uh, if we follow certain sources uh, or if we follow the books or communications like the letters, for example, printed back in the time, uh, or, or we can follow the daily called vilayat, uh, we can follow this Um, state of mind back in the time. So I have two resources. The first one is this Vilayat paper in uh, Turkish and in English. And the other one is the letters uh, communicated by these tribes. And these are archive resources. The war started in Europe Uh, the focal point here is that the um, tribes under the British influence, um, how did they perceive the war? 
you know, until the Ottoman Empire entered the war, they were a uh, they were following a pro-British um, uh, stance. Hamashid Lahej and the other tribes. We cannot say the same uh, for them, but in this center, in the center, uh, downtown Aden, uh, they were basically uh, broadcasting from the minarets of mosques uh, that support the cause of the British. This is until the Turks entered the war. Uh, when the Turks entered the war, some Muslim Arabs in Aden, they started uh, putting uh, um, crescent, crescent and star, the Ottoman flag emblems on their wars and started following uh, propaganda campaigns uh, in a pro-Turkish way, pro-Ottoman way. Re uh, people like Riemann Bree and General uh, Jacob reflect these things uh, in their memoirs. Uh, and there are things that did not reflect in their memoirs. The tribal life as it is today, it was a fact in the social life of Yemen and this was not difficult to accept for the tribes under Turkish uh, rule, but the Muslim tribes under a British mandate could have a dilemma, you know, on the one side, uh, since 1839, that was political, military, uh, architectural activities were being conducted by the United Kingdom. Uh, on the other side, there was uh, the uh, Muslim Empire, the Ottoman Empire, who was... Uh, running through uh, Islamic sensitivities. So they were having a lot of hesitation to take side. You know, other than the mandate under uh, British uh, mandate, let me just focus on the North and then I'll move on with the British mandate part to use the time effectively. So uh, th there are things that reflected on Vilayat uh, daily for example, in 1915, from Hudeide, the Arabic tribes uh, collected and sent a significant amount of aid. So they started supporting the Ottoman uh, army and they started sending uh, telegrams. As you see on the screen, from Hudeide, to Green Crescent or uh, Red Crescent, Hilal uh, Ahmer, uh, a lot of cash aid was done. We can uh, proliferate examples. Uh, the aid that has been done uh, to um, Red Crescent. They were, uh, these these aides are indicating that the people of Yemen supported the Turkish administration. There is another example. There is a letter uh, sent to um, the, the, the Qadi of uh, Taiz. Uh, the Qadi's name was Abdurrahman Efendi. And the 59 battalion in Taiz uh, well, in this, uh, in the fight of this battalion against uh, the British troops, the Qadi had supported this uh, battalion, and the latter appreciates uh, and supports this help. So, in 1919, the, the woman from Kamaire, Sanjak, uh, they purchased, they bought. Uh, uh, cloth uh, and uh, cloth, uh, and they sent it to this uh, battalion in Taiz. About the tribes under British mandate in Taiz, there is an interesting uh, situation about that, because for the tribes 
under British mandate, their reaction is important because after ties in 1915, Nevahi Tisa, that was their name. You know, they, they included nine big tribes and they, their reaction was important for the Ottoman rule. The Ottoman governor, Mahmoud Nedim Bey, and the uh, commander of the uh, 39th Battalion, uh, they started sending letters to these tribes. And in these letters, they followed an Islamic discourse to invite these tribes for uh, jihad. And it was basically a call for alliance against the British. Uh, when we look at the letters sent, we see a situation like that. We might have the names of Germany in places like Iraq uh, and Basra. There is no mention of Germany in Yemen. You know, we're working together with Germany, uh, but Germany is not mentioned in the propaganda in Yemen. The uh, Ottoman authorities reflected the situation uh, as follows. There is uh, an infidel British uh, people and we are fighting with them. So this letter was sent in 1915. Uh, by uh, the leader of Hawashi tribe, Ali Imana. So this is his own handwriting. And the letter basically says that he uh, he pledges allegiance to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, th th this tribe is not far from Taiz, by the way. And uh, after uh, pledging the alliance, this uh, tribe leader, uh, this this allegiance changes the fate of this uh, region. You know, this Havashi tribe, they had to move on to the British side in a reluctant way in 1875. But when the jihad was declared, they uh, endorsed the Turkish authority and started to start fighting the British. A military operation of 39th Battalion uh, in 1915 was hugely supported by this Hawashi tribe. And, you know, the small tribes in the region, they followed the Hawashi tribe uh, and joined the war. For example, El, Muf El Mufallah uh, sent uh, allegiance, loyalty as well. Uh, in a similar fashion. I'm not sure if you see that on my screen, but let me just share this visual. As you see here, we see the stamps of some tribe leaders and some of them use their fingerprints. El Miflahi. This is a member of Yafai tribe, and we see his uh, fingerprints easily. So, as a result, I'd like to say that other than the Fadlili tribe that was under British mandate, all the other Muslim Arab tribes uh, who were previous, who, who had previously accepted the British mandate, they uh, allied with the Turks after 1915 and felt the British. Why do we have the exception of Fazlili tribe? Because in the onslaught in Lahaj, this tribe leader uh, escaped to Aden, and this made things difficult for the tribe. This made it difficult for the tribe to organize. So with discussions and letters, the uh, tribes uh, who were uh, 
previously under British mandate, uh, uh, allied with the Turkish rule. And they said if they are going to support a state, they would start, they would support the Ottoman Empire out of religious sensitivities. In uh, when we uh, have the uh, Mondra ceasefire, you know there was a commandment. Uh, there was a uh, there was a command uh, who said that uh, the Turkish troops should surrender uh, into the closest um, allies' forces. Uh, and after this time, British invasion starts. Hudeyde is inv invaded, and. Hudeyde is given back to Sayyid Idrisi, but Imam Yahya does not accept that. Uh, with the pressure of Sheriff Yusei and Imam Yahya, Hudeyde is given back to Yemen. But, you know, in March 1914, that was a boundary uh, agreement with the British. Uh, in line with that agreement, they get it accepted to... Uh, accepted by Imam Yahya, and uh, uh, until 1960s, uh, the British influence uh, continued. This is all I have to say. I, 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 I hope I didn't exceed the time. I was just going to tell you to wrap it up, and you did wrap it up. Thank you very much. It was a nice presentation. And we can expand on that uh, with the Q&A. To sum it up, the entry of the Ottoman Empire into the Great War, Jihad was declared, and in following that, important tribes who were previously under British mandate, you know, whom you would expect to align with the British, but they didn't do that, they uh, allied with the Ottoman Empire, and this basically indicates how broad our uh, geography of heart is. Did we have the connection with the previous uh, speaker? Do we have Talad Halil online? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. May Allah have mercy on you. I will directly embark on this subject. And our subject is the impressions of a Yemeni ambassador in Istanbul at the end of the reign of Abdul Hamid II. From this subject, we understand that, particularly in the second Ottoman rule in Yemen, there was a significant diplomatic rapprochement between the two countries. And there was a significant uh, friendship between two countries. The delegations came back and forth between the two countries to maintain diplomatic and commercial relationships. Do you hear me well? Yes, we can. Uh, 
وقام بتدوين هذه المجاهدة قسمناها من خلال معطيات الوثائق نو ان يمن We will look at the memoirs of an ambassador, of a Yemeni ambassador in Istanbul. And these observation impressions include stories about diplomatic relationships and economic relationships. And the, and the ambassador talks about his diplomatic mission, about his excursions and he also wrote, writes about the lifestyle in the Ottoman soil to make an introduction to talk about this, to tell you about this ambassador. Yemen did not have a permanent mission in the Ottoman capital. Back then, the Ottoman state did not have a policy to have a permanent mission in Yemen. The relationships were mainly based on written co correspondence. And after that time, there were many diplomatic uh, letters that were sent, and these correspondences were also continued during the ambassador's journey from Yemen to Istanbul, which amounted to a book of memoirs. And therefore, this ambassador uh, during his trip in Istanbul, wrote about the Sultan, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent and some impressions about the city. And indeed, this journey does not cover the whole life story of Muhammad Ramadan, but also These memoirs cover his knowledge about these lands. And later, he offered his services in different positions, such as the Minister of Foundations. And this, he was also part of the Yemeni delegation in Istanbul. He also assumed diplomatic and political positions. And he was he was a part of various diplomatic efforts. The Yemeni ambassador and actually did these efforts by this Yemeni ambassador were the first of its kind. And from this perspective, we see that he was appointed as the governor of Hudaida and and we will be giving some information about this journey. As you know, embassies may be different in different parts of the world. And this trip was based on some political motivations. Of course, it was, uh, this effort was launched in response to a demand placed by Abdul Hamid II. And as you know, Ahmed Fevzi Pasha met with him in Sana'a and he sent a message to Imam Yahya and he gave some information about this team and he told them about the plans of the Ottoman Empire in those lands. And, and this message was delivered to Imam Yahya, and, but the team was not able to deliver the message to Imam Yahya as it should have been. 
And in general, the most important mission of this delegation was to collect information about the recent developments in the region and also de-escalated tensions which arose after the death of Imam, uh, if death of the father of Imam Yahya. And in this message, there was a proposal to hold renewed talks in Istanbul about recovering the stability and peace in Yemen. And the letter said the necessary efforts would be made to restore order in Yemen. Some researchers ask of course, there are various, there were various problems about Yemen, which were conveyed to Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and of course, to defend the Ottoman interests in these lands, some actions were taken, according to the accounts. And this Ottoman delegation uh, this delegation and and here a new delegation was created here which would go to Sultan Abdul Hamid and tell to him about the problems existing in Yemen. But no one asked Imam Yahya whether he would recommend someone to represent him in the delegation, but he did not oppose to creation of such a delegation. So there was We know that some uh, people uh, tried to ensure a reconciliation between the two parties. And we know that the, that Imam Yahya did not have any, did not oppose to the creation of this delegation and the efforts of this delegation. And after the delegation came back, Imam Yahya gave certain powers to the members of this delegation. Of course, they also developed some personal relationships with the Ottoman state. And these individuals often co-opted with the government authorities and in general, this journey started from Hudayda and ended in Istanbul. It was a sea voyage, actually. And we are sorry for the problems in the connection. And when we look at the historical context of this journey and the historical process which brought this delegation to Istanbul, we know that the Ottoman state was actually in the middle of a transformation period at that time. And the Ottoman state was trying to build relationships with different parties. And after that, this delegation paid a visit to Sultan Ahmed Abdul Hamid. And during that visit, the delegation uh, was in mainly had an understanding in many political and military issues. And this visit to Istanbul 
was a significant step to rebuild the relationship between the Ottoman state and Yemen. And after that, the correspondence was resumed between the two parties. And when the delegation arrived in Turkey, the delegation was headed by Mohammed Adan, and he wrote about his impressions in Istanbul. And of course, I will try to summarize his impressions. He has some political and diplomatic impressions as well as social, economic and military uh, impressions. And this journey of uh, Ramadan, the welcoming of the delegation by the authorities, their meeting with the Sultan and the farewell ceremony, the accounts cover all of these events. We see that the Ottoman state has a positive approach to towards Yemen. They had a special ceremony to welcome the Yemeni delegation. They hosted the delegation at a special building and they were very hospitable. And this delegation was supposed to meet Sultan Abdul Hamid. And of course, when uh, this meeting would happen, many issues would be raised. And they went to the Hamidia Mosque every day, and they talked to the people who were close to the Sultan, and they felt uh, a warm environment during these meetings, and they were pleased with the way they were treated. And, and the authorities also organized an, a trip for the delegation, the team, uh, the members of the delegation were taken around the city. And finally, a meeting was held between the delegation and Sultan Abdul Hamid. The whole visit took about 20 days. And the team, uh, the members of the delegation were taken on seven excursions around the city. And they had about 13 stops uh, during their visits, during their travels around the city. And during their stay, all of their needs were addressed by the Ottoman authorities. And they were able to explain the whole situation in Yemen. And they prepared a file to uh, summarize the situation in Yemen. And they reached an understanding with the go government officials. And they were all also able to meet with the Sultan. Of course, the advisors of the Sultan often intervened in the program. They offered uh, some presents and gifts to the members of the delegation. And and the memoirs of Mohammed Ramadan uh, tells uh, gives a detailed account of the reception ceremony, the meetings with the Sultan, the protocol, the rules of the protocol, and the mosque visits, and how the Sultan is uh, welcomed by the 
hosts of these ceremonies in which in some of which the participants kissed the feet of the sultan or kissed his hands so the delegation was not given a chance to offer a detailed account about this situation in yemen and the members of the delegation were quite diverse and let me briefly summarize some highlights of this these memoirs mohammed ramadan tells about the ethnic diversity in ottoman uh, capital he wrote about the Jewish population, the Armenians, the Greeks, and the role of women in the society. And of course, he wrote about the production activities, manufacturing activities. He, he gives some information about the young people and the elderly people living in istanbul and he tells about different uh, lines of work in istanbul and about the hospitality of the Turk ottoman uh, population and he wrote that he was often offered coffee during his visits and And it emerges that this delegation was not very involved in the uh, public life, in the daily life of the population. They visited the Suleimania Mosque and the Selimia Mosque in Edirne and the Topkapi Palace. And he gives a detailed he gives detailed information about those visits. He gives us the exact dates and times of those visits. And it, he emerges as a good historian. And also, he gives us information about some monuments and the palaces and the houses that he sees around the city. And he also gives information about the healthcare conditions in the society, about the economic activities such as agriculture and livestock breeding. He tells us the metrics that are used and he gives us information about the defense industry. He tells about the military structure, the military bands. So he gives a very detailed account of all of these aspects of life in the Ottoman lands. And there are further details in this research if you can check them out anytime you like. Please. So I need to wrap up, I guess. Your, your time is out. Could you please wrap up? Of course. Mohammed Ramadan worked in various positions. Uh, 
في السلطه العثمانيه من عدم السماح بالوفد باللقاء بالسلطه العثمانيه الا في يوم اخير ولمده ربما 10 دقائق الى ربع ساعه فقط. ايضا وعدم خبرته في المفاوضات السياسيه والتجارب دور في في عدم الاعتراض وعدم تسجيل اعتراضات واضحه واحتجاجات واضحه على 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 هذا البرنامج الذي تم التحكم به وحصل انحراف في مسار الرحله من مسار سياسي لحل مشاكل اليمن الى مسار سياحي ترفيهي ولربما حصل actually a form of touristic visit. He wrote about all the details of his program and he also writes that they published a report consisting of 22 items. We reached that report with the help of a colleague and he wrote about the interiors of homes, the demographic structure, the clothing of the people. Uh, these details are absent from these memoirs. So it shows us that this delegation was not given the permission to make a closer observation about the life in Istanbul. That's, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Shukran. 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 Uh, Professor Doctor. Uh, Talal hocamıza teşekkür ediyoruz. Önce bağlantı kuramadık. Ee, biraz tutukluk oldu. Ama sonra da hocamız maşallah açıldı. Ee, ve son dönemlerinde hakikaten... Thank you very much for this nice uh, presentation. Uh, we had connection problem in, uh, in the back, but uh, he made up for that. If we have questions, we'll get back to him. Now, let's move on with the um, the next speaker uh, the next speaker is going to be uh, uh, associated professor Durmuş Akalın from Pamukkale University and he's going to talk about the relations of Ottoman authorities in the second half of uh, the uh, uh, the 19th century with uh, the Yemeni's um, tribes there is an echo in your voice, I think. Um, distinguished academics. Thank you very much. That uh, I'd like to thank everyone who brought this conference together, who brought us together. Look, I'm going to start my presentation with what Yemen means for the Ottoman Empire. In terms of its position, it is strategic. In religious terms, it is important to, uh, to secure Mecca and Medina. In political and economic terms, it was accepted as an essential part of the Ottoman Empire. Many other things could be said about that, but Yemen was not seen as a region of ex economic exploitation. For the Ottoman authorities, it was its cost was more than its benefits in economic terms. In Hudaybiyah and, and in Hudaybiyah and surroundings in the second half of the 19th century, uh, I'm going to focus on the relations between the Ottoman authorities and the tribes in this region. And uh, I looked into the issue from a Hudayda-centric perspective. 
because this was a, a region where the Ottoman Empire established an effective rule and it was uh, close to Red Sea and it was uh, creating, uh, providing relations for the Ottoman Empire. And the relations around the city of Hudeyda would provide a utility um, for uh, the Ottoman Empire. So the looking into the relations of the tribes around Hudeyda, when there were military uh, activities, uh, there was an increase uh, in term in the number of uh, documents that reflected in Istanbul, the relations uh, between the tribes and the European countries and the um, uh, weapon smuggling that continued until the end of the century, telegram lines and the attacks on these lines, they affected the relations of the uh, Ottoman state with the tribes. And uh, the, the Ottoman authorities also had uh, clashes with Sage Idrisi. And uh, pertaining to them, there's a proliferation of documents in Istanbul. So there are many tribes, Beni Mervan, Beni Yerzen, Beni Kais, Yazye, Zamire, Abs and Zaraniks. These are the tribes that I focus on in this research. And uh, the, uh, the central authorities, uh, the central bureaucracy, um, uh, Ministry of uh, in, in, Interior Ministry, Ministry and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I basically focused on the documents in these parts. So I will look into the issue from who they did and I believe I'm going to contribute uh, to um, the discussions on the issue. In, 19, in 1870s, about many Marvan tribe, you know, that was a rule established, and Mustafa Asim Pasha had certain declarations. He says, let's increase the number of troops in the region, and let's establish good relations with the tribes. And he also had recommendations if there are certain figures that were exiled from the region, they could be allowed back in Sana, and that would create a goodwill effect. So the Pasha had also a recommendation that the tax that would be collected in the region should be proportional to the power of these tribes. In 1876, for example, they collected, they considered 5,500 from Beni Marwan tribe, and they decided to decrease it down to 2,000 rials uh, as a sign of goodwill. Then again, there are conflicts between these uh, tribes. Beni Mer Mervan, for example, they attacked on Luhaya, and who, the tradesmen of Hudeyda and Jidda were uh, damaged and a military troop was sent to the region. So once the military was effective in the region, that was a control. Another issue is the relations of European countries with these tribes, especially uh, the British come to the fore. In 1882, there was a, there was, that was an information about um, the governor and it informs the authorities uh, about uh, the weapon smuggling uh, and the armament in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, British uh, cooperated with certain tribes. In 1886, the commander of Red Sea, Mehmet Bey, says, let's uh, get the coastline under control. If we can't, Hijaz and Yemen would be under threat. And at times, it, he came out to be true in this demand. So the Ottoman authorities created strongholds in these regions and established uh, military presence. Beni Yestan is another important tribe. There are ter tensions sometimes between the tribes as well. Um, these tribes are helping the Ottoman Empire. And because of that, in 1870s, for example, there are certain issues. Uh, 
between these tribes, you know, 1909, 1909 and 1911, as of these moments, the tribes started having good relations uh, and the issue of Imam Yahya also uh, had an influence on that. Beni Kais is another tribe in 1903. Uh, the documents that came from this region indicate that British assigned an officer in this region and the Ottoman Empire, of course, rejected that. Uh, and the Ottomans uh, took it as the British trying to expand their sphere of influence. And they, the Ottoman authorities referred to past antagonistic relations and warned the British side. Then, then there's the Kadin uh, tribe, Zalil tribe. A person was lost from that tribe and the tribe attacked the uh, district center altogether and people lost their lives before the military uh, uh, conflict uh, the people uh, of uh, consultation let's say were sent and good relations with, were established with the Talil tribe and The, um, the, the uh, tribe was basically awarded with a Regili um, badge. And in 1900, a telegram was sent from the 7th uh, Ottoman Army. As certain people from this uh, army uh, were on the move, they were attacked, and one of the two tradesmen were killed, and both officers lost their lives, and a military mobilization uh, was started on this event. And they also, the documents also identify that they have found the perpetrators and the tribe uh, turned these people in. Varzeb tribe uh, has been put under control at times, but uh, sometimes uh, there were problems as well. In 1902, the tribe surrounded the Ottoman troops in the region, and uh, the governor of Hudeida was asked for help, and he intervenes, and they promise that they're not going to do anything like that in the future. After 1906, uh, the Ottomans have good relations with Mazab tribe, and they demanded a great for um, uh, award for the leader of the tribe. Looking at the Yami tribe, they're not controlled by Hudeyde, but they have attacks uh, in Hudeyde region at times and the Ottoman Empire uh, follows that carefully. For both Hudeyde and Asir, the Ottoman Empire wants uh, security and uh, they wanted to keep uh, the tribes in their own region. So that would pre prevent a possible conflict between them. After 1890, uh, good relations were established with Yamix and uh, the Ottoman Empire showed vicinity to this tribe and the tribe followed suit. And in, in, in 1904 and 1905, they, uh, they promised uh, that they would help, but they asked for food and weapon from the Ottoman authorities. And the Ottomans considered such aids could be done if it is not going to upset the rule in the region. And 37,000 cents, Ottoman cents, were sent to this tribe because of their help. Two more tribes. One of them is the Abs tribe. Rather than the tribe leaders, we see that they, are, they had problems at times. For example, 
a trades a tradesman called Abdullah bin Muhammad. Uh, he had a problem, and he went to the Ottoman governor, uh, and uh, he didn't receive any help. And this is why he came to Istanbul, and at times he um, filed um, pledges in the Ottoman authorities, and like he, he he filed about 50 pledges, and they were basically executed by uh, the uh, uh, the Ottoman authorities. Uh, and the Ottoman authorities sent telegram to solve the problem of that person, and the, they also said that it is under our, our, our responsibility to solve this problem. The last tribe is the Zarari tribe. It is in the south of Hudayda in 1860s. You know, the state is trying to maintain the order in the region and the Ottoman troops, as they were going through this region, you know, the the uh, soldiers uh, get thirsty and they ask from uh, for drink from the people, and that was a a, a small turmoil. And uh, one person from the tribe lost his life, and this issue, uh, the Ottoman authorities took the issue very seriously, and the issue uh, made its way back, made its way up to the Ottoman central administration. At times, they were uh, weapon smuggling and the uh, district attacks like Beit al -Fakih. Zarani tribe was involved in these issues and the, these issues brought the Ottoman Empire face to face with the British and French authorities. A French uh, from a French ship, certain goods were stolen, for example, and France sent a warship to Hudayda asking for the return of the stolen good, and the Ottoman authorities would exercise a uh, military attack on Zarani tribe, and there would be a French uh, cemetery in the region. And they give some time for that, uh, and the uh, Ottoman uh, representative, Ottoman governor in Hudayda basically said that we would do the first two things that you demanded, but the third one has to do with the central authority. In 1903, there is a thing that happened, you know, while bringing uh, goods from Aden, he was attacked. Something similar was experienced in, in the following year. And upon that the British uh, decided to send warships to the region and the issue that was not sold here was taken up to Istanbul you know 50 British lira was stolen and the British ambassador presses the Ottoman uh, central authorities for that Establishing rule over India, for example, as the British did that, uh, they aimed at that. They came to um, the Red Sea coast frequently, and they used they used the clashes between the tribes and the Ottoman authorities, and uh, they pressed the Ottoman central administration. Ottomans consider that there are. British warships in the region, and uh, they said uh, they should send Kozlu and Galata warships into the region uh, for two things, basically. One of them is to prevent uh, the weapon smuggling. The other one is uh, to crush the British influence uh, in the region. In 1909, there was a military operation by the Ottoman authorities on Zaranik. It was successful. Third, three people were captured and some of them were released. And there is an interesting story on that. According to the information that made it uh, that reached to Istanbul, it, uh, the documents say uh, that uh, the uh, 
people of the tribe complain about the Ottoman uh, district governor. Uh, they say that the governor pressed them uh, and he imprisoned certain people and asked for money to release them. And the Ottoman authorities uh, move uh, uh, and the uh, district governor Kadir Bey was removed from his post. And then in the follow-up, good relations were established with the Zarani tribe. Please wrap it up. Um, okay, I will wrap it up. As a result, from 1872 to 1911, looking into these tribes, uh, the Ottoman Empire had a fluctuating relations with them. But after 1911, uh, better relations were established with the tribes. The, uh, the region of Kolaje were not uh, intervened by the Ottoman authorities. And many uh, conflicts took place between the tribes and the Ottoman authorities sent consultating uh, uh, teams and the Ottoman authorities kept the war military intervention as the last option. About the tax management, the managers warned the central authorities in Istanbul. They said this is a sensitive matter and they're having problems on that. Uh, from among the tribes that I studied, uh, Relay, uh, the, the, the troubles mostly came from uh, the personal affairs between uh, these people. And when there is a significant matter, uh, a misuse of power, for example, the Ottoman authorities uh, replaced uh, the their, their bureaucrat in the region. You know, the Ottoman Empire started having with the British Empire towards the end of 19th century. And departing from that, the Ottoman, these, the Ottoman Empire uh, resisted the British uh, pressure, but the British side basically uh, sent the warships many times to Hudeide. Uh, this is all I have to say. Thank you very much. It was a very fluent presentation and we benefited a lot from it. We are uh, out of time. I had to. I had to warn you. I'll give the floor to Fuad Ashami. But let me just summarize. In the second half of the nineteenth uh, century, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Ottoman Empire's relations were involved in your presentation uh, with the tribes in this region. And the Ottomans uh, consolidated their military presence, but they resorted to the military intervention as a last option, and they tried to solve the issues in a, pe in a peaceful manner. And the Ottomans basically wanted to uh, curb the British influence in the region and uh, try to drag these tribes under its control. And the Ottoman authorities were very sensitive about its relations with the tribes. Uh, Dr. Ashami, the floor is yours. Can you turn the volume up, please? Can you unmute yourself, sir? I'm going to talk about the uh, role of Ottoman army in Yemen between 1848 and 1918. Details, uh, I'm not going to go into details in this presentation. Uh, I'm just going to touch upon uh, important uh, matters. Of course, Ottoman Empire was ruling a vast region and uh, the army was uh, as such uh, and the presence of the Ottoman army was basically securing that and 
the relations with civilians were managed well enough, I can say. Uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, was very sensitive about its military uh, system. One of the most important duties of the Ottoman Empire was uh, maintaining the Ottoman rule and ending the conflict. Therefore, the military was there for internal and external threats and that the army was taking an active role. Of course, all the possible things uh, that the Ottoman Empire could deploy were being used. The military was an important matter for the Ottoman authority and they were very sensitive about that. Ottoman armies intervention took place on uh, important uh, political matters and we realize also in the unseating uh, and reseating of the sultans uh, the Ottoman army played an important role especially in the last part of the Ottoman rule the military role in Yemen is a very clear one of course from the place uh, at the places that were under the Ottoman rule, there were there was this significant military presence. In 1913, the um, local army was vested with authority, uh, and they were making the decisions locally. The situation was not very good. Uh, for on behalf of the Ottoman Empire and the military was there to maintain the Ottoman rule. That was the reason of military presence. And to quell the possible uprising and to prevent possible conflicts by the tribes like Zaydiya, for example, the Ottoman army uh, played important roles. At times, there were uprisings against the Ottoman state, but it was not homogeneous. It was different at different regions. And... Uh, uh, but in the province of Yemen, to establish control, at times uh, the uh, uh, Ottoman, uh, high-level Ottoman uh, executives uh, uh, intervened. They come. They came to the region. When there were problems between the people, uh, the people were resorting to the Ottoman army as well in the places with security issues the military's role was more significant of course in different parts of the region there were such problems at times Looking into the military problems, uh, we can say at times there were pessimistic events, uh, but at other times they were receiving support from the locals. So looking into history, we see that at times we see that the, in the uprisings, people sided with the Ottoman military and they acted against other local people. So, Ottomans did not only influence, uh, I mean, it did not influence the, uh, 
the local Ottoman military, but it basically affected the central Ottoman administration as well. The Ottoman Empire was having significant problems back in the time, and uh, there were problems in many other parts of the empire as well. And as you know, there were economic problems, especially in recent decades. There were delays in the payments of the military, and uh, um, there were sometimes deficits in the armament as well. The Ottoman soldiers in the region Of course, they were living as if they were living in their own uh, homeland. So, in 1907, you know, that was the biggest uprising against Ahmed Shafiq Pasha and the people of Yemen and the Ottoman military quelled this uprising. And in this period, if we look into the uh, uh, correspondence uh, that took place in time, we see this very clearly. During the First World War, the, uh, the Ottoman troops here sustained a significant blow in Red Sea and Hijaz, you know, Sharif Hussein declared a war against the Ottoman army. And that was a blockade around the Ottoman troops. And, you know, the deployment uh, of the military was not, was interrupted. And the Ottoman Empire was not able to support its troops in the region. After the Ottomans withdrew from Yemen, as they got back to their own countries, the local Ottoman soldiers uh, there, they had to surrender to the British forces. Of course, You know, military, uh, local uh, Ottoman military was providing a lot of service to the local people. And a lot of people were benefiting from these services. For example, there were three hospitals in Sana Hudayda and Asir regions. And there were many schools in different cities. The military school in Ansana, for example, and the Mufti in Yemen, they were playing important duties. They were acting, uh, running important duties, and and as you know, Ottoman army suffered from significant problems at times. So this is the basic outline of our research and the details of the research could be seen later. About the other issues, you know, in the formation of the seventh army and the, uh, the 13th and 14th armies were uh, instated and these armies were in uh, Asia and in the region. Looking into the naval forces, there, there were military uh, presence of the Ottomans as well in the region. And the relations 
military civil relations uh, in Yemen deserve further research, further elaboration, of course. Um, the Ottoman presence here was very important. There were conflicts at times, as I said, uh, with the Seventh Army and and in different regions, uh, there were uh, conflicts, there were problems. But as in, in and as you know, the ongoing uprisings were quelled by uh, the army that mobilized from other parts of Yemen. Even the central administration of the Ottoman Empire provided uh, military and monetary support to this region. Again, as you know, in the First World War, during difficult conditions, you know, people of Yemen helped the Ottoman administrations and Ottoman administrations helped the people of Yemen. Uh, they established roads and hospitals in Yemen and people benefited from these things. And as you know, you know, to secure the water sources and uh, trade mobilization, Ottoman Empire spent a lot of effort. And after saying that, I end my speech and thank you very much for organizing this symposium. If you have questions, we can get them right now. You know, we have, we are almost out of time, but if you have questions, a question from Professor Zekeria. Can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. I'd like to thank all the speakers here. I see old friends from Turkey and Yemen, and that made me very happy. But, uh, you know, Mr. Fuad Al-Shami normally speaks very, very good Turkish, but he didn't. And, you know, his Yemeni's accent is what we missed, actually. Uh, and I'd like to um, underline that the provincial territories of the Ottoman Empire and especially uh, for the Arab uh, state, there is no established methodology of research. From Turkey, there is a perspective of looking down on a province. So it was basically a look on the periphery by the Ottoman center. But we have now Yemen-centric, Syria-centric, Egypt-centric historiographies. And, you know, from such meetings, we expect the benefit of establishing common joints. You know, al-mustalahat al-mustalike, as they say in Arabic. If we can't get it established, uh, our efforts are going to go go in vain and the next generation is going to um, be misled. We also have problems. We need a methodology to use the archive information as well. Everything that we see is informative, but if we can't, if we don't read them, uh, interpret them uh, in the context of the region, we might be misled as well. This is what we need. In the periodizations, the first period, the second period, for example, uh, these, that, these periodizations could be revised. They should be revised. Uh, my brother Yahya here mentioned mandate, for example, 
actually it's a legal term and back in the time ottoman empire did not endorse the british mandate in the region but in basra gulf that was a practice of protectorate so it was not much of a mandate it was a uh, protectorate i have an objection to uh, the title of mr talal's presentation uh, you know uh, the expression uh, sefir is not correct if you take it if you take it for post-1918, Sefir could be used, but before 1918, the Sefir cannot really be used as a term. As for these tribes, we are being misled in Turkey as well, because the tribal structure and the traditional autonomy, if we don't understand that well, we see the region as a constantly uprising region. There were some mutual problems and there were mobilizations like uprisings and they should be evaluated very well. But uh, reading the documents, uh, you know, you should basically read these documents in line with the central changes, uh, central changes of the Ottoman Empire. So for every change, there are changes as well and the documents should be evaluated as such. I spoke a little too much. This is I what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the contribution. Thank you. Any other questions or contributions? Um, let me wrap it up then. The geography of Yemen is, you know, it, it may not be uh, my place to talk about these issues in the presence of Professor Zekeria, but uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, there is a very significant tribal structure and in this day and age we can still talk about the tribes and Yemen is as such a place and other than the regions controlled by Houthis tribes are having their autonomous rules so for the powers that wanted to ru rule the region uh, they always look for um, ways to rule the region uh, in cooperation with the tribes. You know, pro beyond protecting Babul Mendeb um, Strait, you know, after uh, uh, Selim the Grim's conquest of the uh, Hijaz region, the Ottoman Sultans became a caliph, and in terms of the protection of Mecca and Medina, Yemen was a you know a an important stronghold. So it was not basically a, a expecting a strategic benefit from Yemen, but it was basically about protecting the Hijaz region, that is Mecca and Medina. If you have any questions or contributions, I can get them now. If not, uh, we are out of time. So I, I can. I'd like to end the uh, uh, session. Translation is being done now. Dr. Talal, microphone is not open. 
He cannot hear us right now. Mr. Hamoud, can you hear us now? Dr. Talal Bey. في حقيقة الأمر أنا لمست بعقالة لمصطلح استخدام مصطلح السفير بأنه السفير غير مقيد غير مقيد وإنما هناك مجازا استخدام الموفى هذا المبعوث لقاضي لي You know uh, the uh, concept of embassy سفير was used uh, a more of a, a, a of a metaphor it was a metaphor in this journey a, a diplomacy prepared a report and in this report there were observations of uh, the uh, ambassador that is sefir uh, of course it was correct to use the embassy and uh, we benefited from people like, like Ab Abdul Rahim. Uh, we employed these terms from their work. We bar borrowed from their work. Thank you very much. Thank you. About, you know, he also borrows this concept from previous historians. And what he means uh, is not an ambassador in the classic sense of the word. Thank, thank you, Dr. Talal. Thank you. Uh, there's going to be a second session in 4 p.m. Uh, and we exceeded our time. You know, we started a little bit late and we are ending uh, a little bit late. So we have completed one and a half hour session. Thank you very much, all the speakers and participants with love and salutations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Till we see each other again. Ashwini Bey, Talal Ahmet Bey, Zekeriya Hocam ve diğer bütün katılımcılara teşekkür ediyoruz katkılarından dolayı. Biz de teşekkür ediyoruz. Şükran Kedirin Cemi. Şükran.
الأول أستاذنا عارف محمد عبد الله فارق الراوي والأستاذ علي سعي صايف والأستاذ عبد الحكيم عبد المجيد الأقرى وأستاذ إب يونيفرستي ذا سكند بانيلست ذا بروفيسور علي سعي صايف من يمن سنا يونيفرستي بروفيسور عبد الحكيم عبد المجيد الهجري من ذا سيم يونيفرستي وند دكتور إب Tissam Al Jarafi from the Directorate of Archiving Department of Yemen. First of all, I would like to pass the floor to Professor Arif Mohammed Abdullah Fari Al Rabi from Ib University. He will be talking about the Ib accident, Ib inst incident in the Ottoman accounts. <laughs> موضوعي أنا لها لها في هذا المؤتمر هو عن قضاء في العهد العثماني من خلال Okay, let's start. I will be speaking about the Ib incident in the Ottoman yearbooks. The Ottoman yearbooks and our reports. These yearbooks give us an account in the of the situation, the economic, social, and health and education in the provinces which were integrated later in the Ottoman Empire. And these yearbooks are easily accessible in the Ottoman archives. We all know that Ib was very important during the late Ottoman era and another province, Tille, which is very close to Ib, was also very important. And there were also governors in that province. But later, when the administrative parliament was appointed, there was a change in the government structure. There is a problem with the audio. So there is a feedback in the Zoom, so the translation has stopped. After reviewing the information in the yearbooks, we compiled other data from other resources, and we created a compilation which shed a light on the developments of that time. Our research subject focused on three main areas. The first subject was the geographical uh, context, then we 
had social assessments and in the third part we had reports related to the ib incident some historians say ib is located like the nave of a human it's right in the middle and it has the best location in the Arabic lands. And we can say it's the most crowded part of Yemen. So historically, it has been a very attractive location. And we can also say that it is the most beautiful city in the world. Some historians call it paradise of Allah on earth. The, it has rich and green vegetation throughout the year. The Ib incident covered six regions. Back then, Yemen consisted of four main provinces, Yemen, Sanat, ties and other two regions and it had six different regions in itself it's looked like paris and hudayda was also in ib in this region and ib was also located in this region The Ottoman yearbooks were quite diverse. These yearbooks of the Ottoman state also cover a huge amount of information about the Ib region. The district governors, assistant of, deputy of the district governor and the peasants living in the area provided certain specific information, all of which was covered in these yearbooks. And also the names of the public officials are also listed in these yearbooks. The muhtars, the village headman, the members of the municipal council were also included. In addition, the district governor, the deputy district governor, the financial chief and other public officials were uh, working in this region were also listed in these yearbooks. The names of the members of the municipal council and the heads of the municipal councils were also included. There was a special municipality council in Ib and there was the mayor and the municipal council, the village headman operating under the municipality. And these individuals were appointed by the capital of the Ottoman state. They came to Ib and they were appointed to various positions. And also a village head man was appointed, which reported to the Ottoman capital. In 1899. And that lasted until one, two, three, five, six. 
11 and 12. Actually, there are many yearbooks. And if we reach all of them, we can get more information. But with the archives and documents that are currently available, allow us to say that the Baghdad uh, district was created. And just like Ib, they created similar administrative structures in this area as well. Some of these yearbooks provide information about the district, uh, the crops and uh, agricultural production activities. And other yearbooks also give us information about the types of grains that are produced such as wheat and also fruits fruits and many other vegetables which are cultivated in this region and people enjoyed the fertile lands of this region actually the area was very fertile for agricultural production, according to these year, this, these yearbooks, we found one more yearbook which to, uh, gave information about the uh, muftis working in this region. These yearbooks also included information about the military ranks and the military structures. And in addition to this, the names of the members of the military were also included in these yearbooks, particularly in the yearbooks of Ib. Also, the types of services were also listed the military positions and the details of these positions were given in these annual books. There was a military region called Hanidia. According to Ottomans, it was very difficult to access this region and organizing a military campaign was very difficult in this region. But despite that, the Ottoman troops fought under very dire conditions in this region. And we get that information from these yearbooks. And we know that the Ottoman troops made significant gains from these campaigns, according to the information given in these yearbooks. Again, in these yearbooks, when we look at the Tibla region, the Ottoman troops made significant gains in the Tibla region because this region had strategic importance. And in Suez region, during the Ottoman era, there was a region area which was between Ib and Suez, and there was a castle in that region. According to the yearbook, uh, according to a yearbook, this is located in the northern part and the castle is located in Bahadur region. It was one of the most important castles during the Ottoman era because it was located between Sana'a and Ta'is, so it was important from the military aspect. There is a lot of information in these yearbooks. I'm just giving you a superficial, some superficial information and we are trying to offer a full evaluation of all the information provided in these yearbooks. And we also try to include the uh, administrative regulations and the administrative tables and the legal terms 
and the social structures that are covered by these yearbooks. And particularly in the recent years, we have seen a lot more of these yearbooks offering much more valuable information. In the magazines and newspapers published in the Ottoman era back then offered valuable information. Newspapers published in Hastahare offered valuable information from Sana to the Ottoman capital and from the Ottoman capital to Sana. People living in the Ib district were quite close to the Ottoman state. The people in Ib who, who still live there, they are, they have Turkish origins. So they come from Ottoman, they are the descendants of Ottoman families. Some of them live in Yemen, in Hejaz, or in northern parts of the country, of the region, such as Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. And the descendants of these families go back to the Ottoman times. There are also the descendants of the Ottoman dynasty. And the district of Ib was famous for many things. Particularly, there were, it was particularly famous for hosting communities speaking different languages. You have three minutes left, by the way. There were very strong connections between the people living in Ib and the Ottoman state. And these connections were sustained after the end of the Ottoman Empire. But today, of course, we can document uh, uh, we can offer evidence of these relations, but some of these documents are difficult to access. The important thing is to give an opportunity uh, for the scholars, because if we have more of these yearbooks in the Ottoman archives, they should be more accessible and we should be able to reach these yearbooks to get more information. Uh, this is our main objective because we want to reveal the truth and we want to write about the truth and show the truth to everyone. And finally, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this event and I hope this symposium is fruitful for everyone. Thank you very much for the valuable information. Mr. El Ravi, Professor El Ravi. Thank you very much. Professor Ali Said Saif Bey. Thank you very much, Professor El Ravi. Now, the next speaker is Professor Ali Said Saif from Yemen Sana University. He will be talking about the uh, impression. Uh, the, incidences of the Ottoman cultural heritage in on the architecture of the city of Sana'a. Professor al the floor is yours. Alhamdulillah, 
قبل أن نبدأ لابد أن نتقدم بخالص الشكر والتقدير لجامعة إسطنبول ولي القائمين والمنظمين على هذه الدورة وهذه الندوة التي مثلت التاريخ الحضاري والثقافي لليمن وتركيا Before I start my remarks I would like to thank the organizers and I hope you enjoy the session In my speech in this part العثماني الأول إلى الوجود العثماني الثاني كان هناك تمر فيها الدولة العثمانية. I will be talking about the influence of the Ottoman culture over the architecture in the city of Sana. I will particularly focus on the era of the Sultan Abdul Hamid II. During this time, many political developments happened. But in terms of architecture, We can, we see that two mosques were built during this period. And this is the Al Urdi Masjid, and it is in the Al Urdi building. It was renovated in eighteen. 18 during the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and this uh, epi epigraph is in Ottoman language, and this masjid was renovated in 1407. This mosque has two sections, an indoor area and an outdoor area and the connected adjacent buildings. And as you can see, the, there is the Habesh stone used on the eastern part of the building. And this is the western section. This is the Mehrab, the area for prayers. There is the Mimbar. And of course, there are the epigraphs, inscriptions in this area, and there is the mimbar, as you can see. This is the second mimbar, which is made of marble, and this marble was brought from Istanbul, and this minaret was later built out of stone and added to the mosque. في قبة البكيرية وخاصة في التجديد الذي كان في عصر غازي عبد الحميد الثاني قام السلطان عبد الحميد بتحسين قبة البكيرية وزخرفتها أفندم أفدرسنز أفدرسنز سسلر مزك قطع بيرير ميس لطفاً سس ميكروفون لار مزك قطع تفضل يا أستاذ علي تفضل وقد تنوعت هذه الزخارف ما بين النباتية والهندسية at the time of uh, Abdul Hamid II, you see the ornamentations uh, and uh, Abdul Hamid II uh, got this done in 1298. And upon its finish, there is uh, the verse from Quran, Nasrum min Allahi wa fatun karib. And the second writing is on the Mihrab side. This is again Ottoman uh, ornamentation. Uh, this was built in 1297. And under the dome here, you see the ornamentations. It goes back to the second uh, period of the Ottoman time. And at this point here, there is the white stone and you also see the black stones. And 
This was uh, popular uh, in Istanbul in the Ottoman period. And there is uh, there's this verse uh, engraved there and you see the candles uh, attached to the dome and the ornamentation here. And as you see here, uh, the ornamentations belong to the Ottoman architecture. And one of the most important architectures, uh, you know, um, architect, uh, uh, architectures uh, were uh, manifesting themselves in the mosques uh, and houses. And um, you see uh, the mihrab in Sana'a, but it looks like as if it is uh, in Istanbul. And we see the um, the works of Seljuks and Ottomans here. At this side of the mihrab, there is the writing. The one who built a mosque uh, for uh, the pleasure of Allah uh i believe uh got his um wish accepted people uh, do prayers here and when we calculate uh the um abjad uh, of these uh um letters it is 1297 again and as you uh, look at the minbars uh, they look like um uh, the mosques uh from istanbul there is the door with two uh, wooden wings and ornamentations of these wings uh, represents uh, the, uh, the Ottoman style. It has a gl uh, clove and other flowers that, which were popular in the Ottoman times. And as you see the ornamentation here, all of them uh, were taken from Turkey. So this was basically Ottoman ornamentation. On top of this minbar, uh, there is this um, dome and it reflects, it reflects the um, minarets of the Ottoman minarets. So we see the Ottoman architecture here as well. You know, uh, the ornamentations reflect Baroque and Rococo style. They were again uh, made in Turkey and transferred to Yemen. Uh, again, uh, blue and white colors were used at times. Looking at these ornamentations, you know, in the middle of the dome, you know, at the dome of Bakiriya. Uh, we see Baroque ornamentations and here we see different ornamentations that would involve white, uh, blue and black colors mostly. Again, you see many flowers in the ornamentations. Another manifestation perhaps is in architectural terms, has to do with the uh, the effect of Ottoman architecture on the buildings. As you see, the neighborhoods were set up, and this map belongs to this neighborhood. Uh, an Italian uh, was uh, drew this map. It has gates, the neighborhood has gates in different places. You see these large buildings, they're large in width and height in the upper stories of these buildings. Uh, 
they were popular uh, they were popular and um, another thing that you see here is the office of the ottoman governor ahmed ferit pasha and it turned into that later and that was the national museum ahmed fevzi pasha's uh, work uh, coming from 1871 it is a Yemeni's style and as you see there is a door and it has windows on both sides you have five minutes left professor Ali looking at the military garrisons the Ottoman Empire has made it more of a horizontal in a more horizontal fashion this was done uh, by the ottoman sultan's command uh, on muhammad izzet pasha you see the uh, the seal of the ottoman sultan the engravings are in ottoman and arabic and the third uh, is uh, the food soldiers uh, garrison and uh, there were officers and we see the hospitals like art house thank you very much uh, professor ali uh, because these are very important uh, visuals I'll give you more time than five minutes. One other thing uh, of military uh, architecture is the hospitals. This is a manifestation of Ottoman architecture. Uh, you know, the um, as you see, there there's this garrison and um, it is a, an artillery garrison and everywhere you see the signs of the ottoman architecture old uh, city walls of yemen changes were made on them Uh, by the order of uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, that this gate was then built because there was a need for a gate like that. You know, these uh, ornamentations are still there. You can still see them. And you see that they are like one-to-one uh, -one consistent uh, with the Ottoman style. And for the people to mobilize, to move uh, in a comfortable manner, this door was enlarged. And in 1962, this uh, door was uh, replaced with a new one. So the manifestations are not limited to military or religious buildings. Uh, you see them in other service areas as well. You know, the archive uh, documents indicate that Ahmed Fevzi Pasha, the Ottoman governor, built circular roads around Sana and you can just go around the city following these roads and uh, these roads um, are uh, stone roads, cobble stone roads. The Ottomans built three hospitals. Uh, the first one is Humaydi Hospital. Uh, the other one is Guraba Hospital. You know, many uh, staff members were working there they gave they gave they gave the name who made it later on in 1899 this hospital was divided into three the first part was about planning and then the doctor's office and the pharmacy there was also of course the examination office the nesij house 
here, that is to say the weaving house. This was called Darun Nisij back in the time. Ahmed Fevzi Pasha built this building and they were uh, tailoring clothes here. And you see the signs of the Ottoman architecture, the emblem of the Ottoman uh, state. And when you look at the uh, entries, there were two different entries. I'm sorry if I exceeded my time. May Allah's blessing be upon you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ali Saeed, for this nice presentation. You know, in the second period of the Ottoman rule, uh, he talked about Ottoman uh, architectural manifestations. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Abdul Majid Al Akra from Yemen Sana University. And he's going to talk about the legal reform uh, of that period. أستاذ عبد الحكيم أه نعم هل يمكن أن نسمع صوتكم Dear professor are you ready can we just let's test your connection okay the floor is yours you have 15 minutes please the floor is yours Assalamu alaikum. At the beginning, I'd like to start uh, with thanking Istanbul University and everyone else who put this uh, symposium together. I'm going to talk about the legal reform of the Ottoman Empire uh, between uh, 1848 and uh, 1918. Uh, the legal sector uh, witnessed imp important improvements in this period. Significant reforms were connect, uh, conducted and it was independent. Uh, the decisions were made independently from the, uh, uh, the uh, political authorities in between 1849 and 1918, there were uh, political developments and the re, uh, these uh, legal reforms were in line with these uh, developments. Uh, the Ottomans uh, cared about this issue. They attributed a lot of importance uh, and uh, they were trying to replicate the legal structure uh, that they had in Istanbul in um, Yemen. And they followed the Islamic law, you know, Mejelle, I'm talking about. Many important decisions uh, were being made. In the uh, Yemen province, uh, sometimes these reforms were being misunderstood, just like in Istanbul. And uh, th therefore, there was a need for reform. Uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, spent enormous effort to improve the, the legal reforms. In the period of imams, you know, the uh, legal affairs were simple and uh, you know, many um, many proceedings involved the customs and traditions of the region, but uh, upon the legal reforms, better legal work came out. So, you know, uh, the um, legal reforms created a structure to respond to the needs of the local people. 
and uh, the regulations were in line with the uh, juncture of the time. So the uh, Ottomans um, provided a system for the people to get their affairs resolved. Another issue is the uh, legal um, courts, you know, the courts were aiming at uh, spreading the justice of the Sultan and these were, uh, you know, the courts of expertise. They came, they were established in additions to the courts of Sharia. There were criminal uh, courts, there were, there were uh, Sharia courts, and there were uh, the uh, court, courts of appeals. So all these things were conducted um, in line with this understanding. Nizamiya courts were first in Istanbul and the reforms that took place here during the age of Tanzimat the uh, reforms were conducted to uh, empower the legislation as well in different periods you know for the foreigners in Hudayda Many reforms were uh, conducted to protect their rights. The Ottomans uh, established two courts and the uh, issues were being resolved uh, with these courts and the presence of these courts were very important. The targets of Islamic Sharia were, of course, being observed and uh, under Imam Yahya's control, under his leadership, they maintained their activities. Ottomans wanted to solve different problems of the local people. They were being done if in different provinces, so and it was not just in Yemen. Legal reforms were being conducted, for example, about Jews in Yemen. Ottomans um, conducted reforms that uh, took their Sharia into account as well. Just like other religious groups, the rights of the Jews were um, uh, protected as well. And there were the... Um, courts of appeal uh, and then there was the high court and then there was the uh, audition the investigation delegation in all these provinces one of the most important things that the ottomans conducted uh, in uh, the framework of the reforms is the presence of uh, the general mufti and the general prosecutor. And in 18, until 1877, from 1977 to 1911, the process moved on like that. And at the same time, until 1918, there were diff 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 different um, uh, specific courts, courts of expertise, and these courts, well, they didn't uh, appreciate the, um, uh, a, a, a prominent reason that the tribes did not appreciate these reforms is that they perceived these uh, uh, courts were uh, going astray from Sharia, and in a similar manner, uh, the state appointed Qadis in uh, the region in this period, and in terms of the Qadi assignment, different 
you know, they, uh, the Ottoman administration was not appointing anyone from these tribes uh, to maintain uh, a neutrality of the decisions, independence of the decisions. So uh, the uh, legal decisions were being made on a careful basis and in the court cases, and in the overall legal system, uh, the legislation uh, uh, should be uh, sh uh, should be uh, autonomous. It should be protected against a, a political or otherwise uh, oppression. To this end, uh, the um, Ottomans conducted important legal reforms and. They followed the teachings and the values of the Islam, uh, Islamic religion, and you know the relations between Imam Yahya and Ottoman administrations. Uh, well, they improved based on these reforms. In terms of legislation, many uh, issues were overcome. Uh, and this was how the state uh, functioned in general. So let me suffice here. That is all I have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdul Hakim. Uh, it was an enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, in the Ottoman period and in the following period, uh, he talked about the um, legal reforms. We do have time. I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Ibtisam Al Jerafi. Uh, he's going to talk about the education and the Ottoman schools. Uh, and she's going to share information based on the archive information. Thank you. Very, I'd like to start with uh, thanking uh, Istanbul University. Um, I'm going to focus uh, on the period between 1877 and 1918. As you know, education in this period uh, was going through new formations, uh, you know, New schools were formed in 1848. There were, uh, the Ottomans established uh, the Ministry of Education uh, and conducted central reforms. And there's these reforms uh, reflected in the region. And New systems were being established in the Ottoman capital and its periphery, its provinces. Uh, Yemen and Sana were given a lot of importance, and this gives important information about information about the education in time. Professor Ebtisam, can you please read slower, please? Uh, we want to understand you. The um, decrees of Yemen and uh, Ottoman decrees uh, constitute an important, poor, important part of this uh, educational establishment. They uh, frame how the education was done uh, back in the time in Yemen at every level. You know, it, it uh, elaborates on the education system uh, based on the grade system. 
and uh, it provides information about students as well. As you know, in the Ottoman period, one of the most important reforms was uh, on education and in the uh, parliamentary sessions uh, Yemen came to the agenda in uh, political and educational terms and in 19th century Ottoman Empire sent a delegation to evaluate the status of education in Yemen and they reported that the reports, uh, the, the reforms that are being conducted in Istanbul should be replicated in this region as well. In uh, 1989, this report was given to Abdul Hamid II, and an education uh, director was uh, sent to uh, Sana, uh, and he formed a delegation and. Uh, they focused on building the schools and they built um, a management of uh, education and at every Sanjak they formed a uh, new uh, management and they focused on the improvement of the overall education system and uh, solve the problems pertaining to education. They were working under um, the uh, Ministry of uh, Education in Istanbul. The existing uh, educational institutions were supported by the central authority of uh, the empire. They made improvements. They, they uh, fixed the buildings that needed um, uh, renovation. And in educational terms, uh, these people were experienced and then they established uh, uh, important uh, caters with a good know-how. And in 1869, a decision was made on the education of children in Yemen and teaching of Quran and Islamic values to them, uh, Islamic sciences, uh, the Ottoman um, dictionary, history, uh, and uh, uh, craftsmanship, health, and music. Uh, you know, on all these issues, um, important decisions were made, and the students were admitted in Rushdie schools. It was a three year education plan. Uh, uh, this was not a mixed gender education, by the way. It was boys' schools and girls' schools separate. And in a, a, uh, in in eighteen eighty eight, in different regions, these schools uh, were established. Uh, again, in eighteen eighty eight, the number of students at these schools increased and in Sanya and Asar more students uh, started to come to these schools in Sana you know based on the uh, provinces registry uh, we can see that they were uh, registrating the students and these registries were sent to Istanbul actually and uh, to involve in the Ottoman uh, education system. Uh, the uh, education here was being reformed on a constant basis. Uh, in the periods where the institutional deficit was the case, uh, you know, there were, uh, there were no schools in certain regions and this situation was reported back to the uh, Ottoman capital and in 1902, the number of educational institutions was, uh, was uh, 69. In Tasodeida uh, and Asil regions, uh, these uh, educational institutions intensified and in Asr uh, Sanjak, uh, 
As of 1912, 2,600 students were present at these schools. Again, in Rushdie and Idadie, you know, these were prep schools in the Ottoman system. They were like elementary schools. So what was the point with these schools? The students would be trained here and they would be employed in the administration of the empire. And then in the period of the Abdul Hamid II, Rushdie uh, schools were established for four years, religious educations and Ottoman grammar uh, and Arabic, Persian and mathematics uh, were being taught. Uh, calligraphy and general history, uh, Ottoman history, geography, local language, and French were being taught at these schools. You know, that was the uh, in the curriculum of the fourth grade that the French language was an elective course. So these reforms in education, uh, they were comprehensive. They were basically very inclusive. And at times, the schools did not respond to the needs. Uh, this was reported, and as a result of that in different regions, the number of uh, schools were increased. There was a proliferation of schools. The Ministry of Education practiced these decisions in different parts. You know, Rushdia or the military schools in Samatais and us regions, these schools were established. The aim with that is uh, involving the local people into the seventh army of the Ottoman Empire. Successful students were uh, further trained in different parts like Istanbul, and the state was uh, providing for their needs, providing uh, for them. They were uh, functioning under the um, uh, Ministry of War. Looking into preparatory madrasas, you know, uh, the new ones were built and the reason for that was to support scientific education. It was a three year uh, education and two of them were made in the Ottoman period. Uh, the second one continued until 1913, and it was later con converted into a sultani. That was a different type of madrasa. And then later it was con converted into a military school, Rushdie. And then it was shut down because uh, Rushdie was enough uh, and uh, there was no need for a military school. The Idadie schools... And Sultani schools were uh, providing education before the university level, and they trained uh, people who would be employed within the state bureaucracy. Again, the uh, there were occupational schools in Sana and Hudayde. Uh, the Art uh, and calligraphy were, were being taught at these schools. And, you know, about the um, needed occupations, uh, the state was providing the necessary tools from shoemaking to waving and from there to textile and hand craftsmanship. Uh, educations, trainings were being provided in many fields and as such these cities and the cities were providing uh, for their needs so they were kind of becoming independent they were able to stand on their own feet Of course, they established Darul Muallimin in Taiz uh, region. 
Islamic education was being provided. You know, uh, in 1914, a report was sent to the prime minister of the Ottoman Empire and a school was set up for uh, the education of the teachers, but it was not very successful. So later on, the ministry shut the school down. As a result, in conclusion, Ottomans conducted many reforms in Yemen province, and these reforms were conducted in a fast manner. One of the most important fields of reforms uh, was the education field. And looking at the number of students, uh, in line with the number of students, teachers were being educated and education was free in Yemen. You know, uh, in a legislation made in 1967, it was stated that everyone should be able to benefit from these uh, educational activities. Uh, you know, all the, uh, the people from different religions, different religious backgrounds were able to uh, get this education. They had access to education. So the, they were uh, calling the students for this system. And uh, the empire was incentivizing attendance at these schools. Uh, similar studies were being conducted in Sana and other places. In different parts of the empire, such trainings were uh, being provided. In the regions of Sana and Asir, uh, there were educational institutions that were taking women as students. And in the following formation, the people who underwent the education from these institutions played an important role. And, you know, at times there were problems. Some political, social uh, issues were uh, being raised. Uh, the uh, anti-Ottoman groups were uh, sabotaging the education system, but despite all that, students were uh, sending their kids uh, to these schools. And the masjids, actually, masjids were being used as well. Uh, these institutions um, and the mosques were not operating under the Ministry of Education, uh, and uh, this enabled people to conduct uh, their prayers in these places in a free manner. So the educational management of the Ottoman Empire open space for um, people uh, like Zaydis and other groups. The Ottoman education, of course, uh, th th there were important uh, reforms and they came with a cost on the empire's budget and Especially in Zaydi regions, there was intensification of training and uh, uh, many students were uh, educated at these schools and they came to important positions in the Ottoman bureaucracy and Yemen. In the post-Ottoman period, these people contributed greatly. Thank you very much, Dr. Ebtissam. It was a very enlightening speech. She mentioned the legal reform. Uh, she mentioned the reforms in education. Um, and 
she addressed the activities in the scope of these reforms. Thank you very much. And now I see that we have 20 minutes until the end of this uh, the session. From among the participants, any questions or comments? Oh, you might also want to. Uh, you might also want to um, enlighten certain issues. Uh, uh, the speakers could ask questions to each other. Um, Any questions? I don't see any questions. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who um, presented and who uh, participated today. I benefited a lot today. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Arif Mohamed Abdullah and Professor Ali Saif from Yemen Sana University, thank you very much. And Professor Abdul Hakim Abdul Majid, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Ebtisam El Jarafi as well. Uh, they presented very nice speeches. Uh, so this was the second session of our symposium. Uh, uh, you know, there's going to be a second day tomorrow in this symposium. God willing, we'll get back together tomorrow uh, with different presentations uh, on different topics, on different issues. Thank you very much for all the contribution. Thank you once again. So there was no question. Do you have any questions to participants? No. Okay. Uh, I thank the participants. I thanked them separately. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, in uh, their own field, they presented uh, important uh, uh, issues. They touched upon issues in cultural, uh, educational, and legal terms. Professor Arif Mohammed uh, uh, focused on the district of Eib. Uh, in the Ottoman decrees, and Professor Ali Said uh, mentioned, the, uh, talked about the architecture in the city of Sana in the second Ottoman period. Um, he uh, gave a lot of information about the uh, properties of the buildings that were built back in the time. Professor Abdul Hakim from Sana University. He mentioned the legal reforms. It was a detailed uh, presentation. And and Dr. Ibtisam El Jerafi, she mentioned, she uh, presented the Ottoman educational reforms between 1877 and 1918. In, for the students of Yemen, uh, different uh, types of education were provided, especially, uh, you know, the reforms were conducted about the education of the Zaydis. That was an important point. Uh, and Zaydis had their own education. The Ottoman system allowed that, especially the references to the period of Abdul, ha Abdul Hamid II. Uh, uh, well, uh, this period was um, frequently mentioned. So that so 
that was a period of reforms and the, the reforms were reflected in Yemen as well. So important changes took place in this period. Thank you very much uh, from the participants or the audience. If no other question, uh, I'd like to adjourn the session. Thank you very much for listening. Inshallah, after COVID-19, we'll get face to face uh, and talk about these issues. And that is, I hope, in the near future. Once again, thank you very much and um, God, God be with you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.